I interviewed Tay three years ago. He just tweeted out, I'm open to podcast interviews. And I said, hey man, I just started a podcast. I'm a psychotherapist and maybe you could come on. I could psychoanalyze you. And he was all about it. So that interview uh, became very, very popular among his fans. Everybody has these feelings, fear, anxiety, loneliness, sadness, feeling like I'm not enough. Everybody's got some version of that story. To get really honest about what you actually feel. Now that's a hard thing to do because we don't want to let ourselves know how we feel, but letting yourself know what you think think and how you feel in every given situation, that's how you get present. It's the only way to be present. Well, when you interviewed Andrew Tate, one thing that really stuck out to me was how you sort of pressed into the topic of his childhood and then his relationship with his father, right? Mm -hmm. He said that he had to earn his father's time, right? right? Was there anything that stood out about that that you noticed? You know, I want to be careful here because I, I, I don't want to like psychoanalyze Tate too much publicly, but yeah. I think like if we can talk in generalities, I think What's happening, David? I'm uh, I'm here with you in San Diego, beautiful San Diego, sunny San Diego. One of the, one of my favorite cities in the world, at least for the weather. It's a great city, especially coming from Texas, where it's just it's as we were talking about it earlier. It's so hot. It's been like 103 every day for like three, four months, and so it's nice to come to San Diego and get some temperate weather, a nice breeze by the ocean. Yeah. I love it here. Yeah, coming from, so you're originally from Saskatoon, right, Canada? Born in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. Grew up in Southern Ontario, about an hour and a half south of Toronto in the Niagara region, and then moved to Toronto. I went to the University of Toronto, studied there, and that's where I started my acting career, and then ultimately, ultimately moved to New York, very briefly, and then to Los Angeles, and I lived there for 20 years. Uh, bounced around a little bit uh, once I retired from acting, trying to figure out where I wanted to live and ended up in Austin, Texas. Got it. Do you miss the Four Seasons? I do miss the Four Seasons. Yeah. I like winter. I yeah. don't I don't like six months of winter and bitter yeah. cold, right. but I lived up in Idlewild, California. It's uh, about two hours east of LA. It's a mountain yeah. town. Like Santa Barbara-ish? Uh, no, it's, the, it's, okay. it, it's towards, uh, uh, what's the, Palm Springs. Got it, okay. And elevation's about 5,500. So they would get snow. Yeah. Um, but it didn't get too cold. And I thought that was perfect. Perfect, A right? snow here and there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, weather in the sometimes high 30s, 40s, you know, you bundle up. It's fun. Yeah. So I don't I don't mind that. I do miss the seasons. Yeah. It's not like 20 below zero in Canada, you know. I mean, I lived in Alaska growing up for a good portion of my childhood, and I uh, don't ever want to live in a place like that i want to go to places like that but i don't ever want to live in that well, i was talking with my girl about this it, but it does make you tough yeah like the for extreme sure. weather forces you to kind of get strong and there's yeah. something about that with texas i didn't really understand texas when i moved there i'd been there a few times but that heat it does something to you and it forces you to kind of find some inner strength. And I, I started to understand why Texans are the way they are. It's right. Part of it's just the geography. Like you yeah. grow up in that environment. You've got to be strong. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to be self-reliant. And uh, so I understand why Texas, you know, has that, that, uh, attitude, that philosophy. It's funny you say that because I've always wondered when you think about geographic reason, regions and then you think about the accents that correlate with that. So like Russia, it's a very sharp, bitter language. And you think of people from like Hawaii or Samoa and it's a very like, oh, like a lot of like, I don't know. I just wonder if the weather played into that. And that's why there's I mean, just think about it. No, right? absolutely. Like, my my grandmother was a New Yorker, so fast talking. Yeah. And she retired down to Savannah, Georgia. And it was very hard for her because Savannah, Georgia, yeah. they talk real slow. It's like, Come on, hurry it up. Let's exactly. Go. But what she realized is, well, of course they talk slow. It's incredibly hot down there. Yeah. And you, you have to learn to just relax. Right. But in New York City, it's busy, busy, busy. So I think you're absolutely right. The 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 way we talk, the accent, all of that is affected by our the geography. Right, right. So a couple of things I want to dive into. Um, obviously, you do some psychotherapy, and I want to talk about that and the unconscious mind and the things mm -hmm. that come from the subconscious to the uh, you know the our awareness. And obviously your interview with Tate we'll get into. Um, you went to Romania and interviewed Andrew Tate for the second time? Yep. Okay. 
And then, uh, yeah, you were in Gilmore Girls and uh, you had an acting career. So you've had quite the quite the life. And um, now you're diving into the content creation and all of that stuff. So um, love it. So so tell me about uh, Romania. How was it going out there? Uh, well, I you know, it all happened very quickly. Uh, I interviewed Tate uh, three years ago. Uh, and I was telling you the story before we got on. Uh, he just tweeted out, I'm open to podcast interviews. And uh, and so I responded. And I said, hey, man, I just started a podcast. I'm a psychotherapist. And maybe you could come on. And I could psychoanalyze you. And he was all about it. Yeah. And so that interview uh, became v uh, very, very popular among his fans. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he himself, uh, said it was his best interview, which surprised me. I, I mean, I, I thought it was a good conversation, but I was also new to podcasting and interviewing people. Although when you're a psychotherapist, that's essentially what you're doing. You're interviewing people. You're, you're asking them questions and trying to probe and trying to understand what, how they work, how they think. So the skill is, is, uh, applicable to, to interviewing people for podcasts and it did translate. And I think people were interested uh in the idea of tate being psychoanalyzed because he's so certain about everything but m people maybe feel well maybe there's some things underneath the surface that he's not aware of and and i found him open and and willing and and curious yeah about that so uh and then i don't know about six eight months ago uh he reached out to me again and he said listen i'm getting after he blew up and he was everywhere right uh, and he said uh you know i'm getting all these podcast requests but i i want to do an interview with you right and i was very flattered surprised yeah. uh because we hadn't kept in touch and i said absolutely let's do it and then two days later he got canceled off all social media right and i didn't hear from him for a while and then, you know, I just, I, he had a lot going on. And then eventually I reached out to him. I said, hey, how about that interview? And he said, absolutely. And two weeks later, I flew to Romania and was at his compound and and, and we shot this interview. So it was it was kind of surreal. I'd never yeah. been to Romania before. It's a beautiful country. Right. It's a poor country. It's, <clears throat> it's There's a vibe there, uh, you know, old communist country. Uh, but it's also, you know, Tate is so, he's everywhere. He's ubiquitous. And, and we, we see all the videos of his compound and all of that. So to, and I, I met him, but it was over zoom. So just the going first time, there, right? the first time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. just going there and uh, walking onto the compound, which I've seen a million times and, yeah. in his videos and then coming into his house and then seeing him in person and his, his brother and all the, his whole crew, it was, yeah, it was a little surreal. So and I was yeah. obviously a little bit nervous about the interviews, a powerful man and incredibly famous. And, and you're in his, you're at his home, home turf, you know, you're I'm on his home turf. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I flew in and it's the, the time difference. I think between Austin is like eight hours so yeah. I'm jet lagged and you know, is my brain going to work? I don't know. Yeah. Huh. What was the vibe like in his area? Right. I'm always curious. Cause when we went, Carlos and I went and interviewed, uh, uh, Pat Ridge and Pat's a great, do you know who Pat Ridge is? Mm -mm. He's, pretty famous on TikTok. He has a sober living house and very controversial because he records people and it's like an open format and uh, he gets a lot of flack for it. But the energy there was very weird. I don't know. How would you describe it? A little very dark, I'd wow. say, because there's a lot of I mean, it's a it's a sober living place. So people are fighting their demons there. And I've got seven years of sobriety, so I understand a little bit about that, you know, but, um, but what was the energy like at the Tate compound? Like, do you remember of a vibe? Just a bunch of dudes having a good time. Yeah. You know, they're training every day. His brother, he had a whole, whole crew of guys there. His mom was there. Uh, it was very family oriented. They had to have these big dinners and, uh, you know, Tate, Tate's all, you know, he's all business. Yeah. Uh, when he's working and, and he was working a lot, but, uh, they, they, nothing you got the feeling that nothing was going to get in the way of tate having a good time right uh having fun and i mean he trains really hard but it was it was friendly it was jovial um they were still under house arrest at the time yeah uh, but his his spirits were high uh I, I felt like it was a it was a it was a great energy i mean it's it's He's the, it's like what you see is what you get. Like yeah. he's not hiding anything. It's not right. it's nothing different than than what you see online. Yeah. Yeah, and that's one thing that I like about this new 
kind of content and new. I mean, when you look at the most popular people in the world 10, 20 years ago, it's all Hollywood, right? All Hollywood, New York people, right? But now that's kind of shifting away. But one thing is I feel like in Hollywood, and you spend a lot of time in Hollywood, would you say that most people that you see in Hollywood, celebrities are not like that when you actually get them in a room? Or is it that similar, what you see is what you get? Well, I think in Hollywood, people's images are very protected. I mean, or at least traditionally they have been, but then what we've seen with social media is that the currency is really authenticity, letting people into your life, letting people into your struggle, showing yourself without makeup, showing that that you're cellulite, whatever that is, that's what people respond to. Yeah. Um, but I will say I did an episode of friends, uh, back when I was, yeah, when I was starting out and that was a fascinating experience because, uh, it was their 150th, 50th episodes that had been on the air for quite some time. It was wow. a lot of show and television Yeah. at the time they were all making $750,000 per episode. Yeah. And, and that's in the late nineties, right? Said, yeah. So. Late nineties. Exactly. Yeah. 98, 99 maybe 2000, somewhere in there. Yeah. And I'm sitting on the couch in the the coffee shop and just, you know, kind of feeling into it. Wow, you know, here I am on Friends. And the thing that was interesting to me is that all of them in real life were sort of like their characters. It was like their characters were almost exaggerated versions of themselves. Okay. So that was, and that's what I learned uh, through uh, my years in television. It's like, I mean, obviously, if you're playing some kind of baddie or yeah. extreme character, that, that's a little bit different. But it's almost like you, your essence will come through. Right. Like, and so who they are, you can you can really feel it through the character that they're playing. And I think that's what changed my attitude is like, I'm not going to try to show up as some character. I'm actually going to try to be as much of myself yeah. as I can be. And if I can be as much of myself be authentic be real be truthful that will be interesting and compelling i have to trust that i don't don't try to be something other than what i am right now do you think that they were picked for those roles because of their personality or do you think that happened after the fact like they sort of you spend so much time mentally in this role and going to a different place that you kind of become that person is that it's kind of a combination of both okay um, casting is, uh, you're really there cause there's so many good actors in Hollywood. I mean, right. so much talent. I would walk into a room for a, like a network test and it'd be me and four other guys. And every single one of them had been on TV series and right. was successful. And I was like, Jesus, um, how am I going to compete with this? Uh, but then you started to realize, well, we're all good. Like we, we all, we're all in the industry. Like everybody's got talent. So yeah maybe some is are more talented than others but when they're casting particularly in tv it's like it's a type right and so you know they're going to choose the person that's right for that role and so there's something about and, and that's always a mystery right yeah like for for casting you're looking for that person to come in it's not always the best actor it's the yeah. person who's most right for the part and so once you get that part and yeah once you start playing it over and over and over and over again that's what you're doing every day for a year or two years or five years yeah it gets inside your head in a way and it 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 actually separates you from reality right and i you don't realize it until you're out of it yeah uh which is like anything really um but yeah you your mind your whole being is starts to get oriented towards the creation of this character and you start to embody it and live it in a way uh, and it, yeah, it takes you over for better, or for worse. Right. Right. Do you think that a lot of, cause I mean, you know, the things that you do consistently create these neural networks in your brain. Do you think that people hardwire themselves in a different way? And then when they're, you know, when they finally stop and they have time to look back, they're like, wait, I'm not this person. Is that kind of how it is? Um, I, I it's not that they're not that person. It's just, you let something take you over. Mm. You have to let something take you over. And that process is not always fully conscious. Right. Like some something else, like any creative endeavor, there's a there's a magic to it. And and you have to surrender to that whatever that magical thing is right. that, that 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 creativity is, especially if you want it to be great. And so it's just a you're just letting yourself go into some 
some aspect of yourself, some energy. This is the, the way that I see it. I'm sure other actors, you know, would sit down and, and maybe they have a different point of view. Yeah. But you just have to give over to something. And so it's, I, I think it's like an aspect of you or another possibility. Like if I was in this situation, if I had this history, how would I be? And then you, you explore that. And that can be really exciting. Right. But at the same time, yeah, once you get out of it, and I had this on, on Cracked where I played a, a cop with PTSD. I didn't realize how crazy I was acting right. until we wrapped uh, the first season and I had about a month off and I was like, oh man, I was in something. Right. Like I was in some other vortex that I needed to be in, but now that I'm out of it, uh, you, you know, I, I, feel, I felt a lot of, well, I had a lot more awareness and relief about it. Right. Right. There's no escaping it. It's going to take you over. But that's anything. It's like a job that you're in. You're a podcaster. Like you're an actor. You're a dancer. You're 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 a businessman. Like that becomes your life. And and yeah, your your mind gets wired in a certain way. And yeah, you have to make that commitment. And and that's what your life becomes. So how much of our character, just from like a psychoanalyst perspective, how much of our character is molded from childhood? You know, and we form these roles that we play going into life. I mean, that's the age old question, right? Nature versus nurture. I think that everybody's got their own individual essence and you can't get away from that. Right. Uh, and other people might say everybody's also has their own karma. Like yeah. they, they chose to be here and, and you chose to have this, these parents and this set of circumstances. Yeah. Maybe I'm open to that, but yeah. we, we can't know. Um, what I do know from my work is that we are heavily impacted by the experiences that we have in childhood. Right. Um, that on some uh, unconscious level, the child is always going to shape themselves to fit what they perceive their environment slash parents want from them. Right. Because that's the best strategy for survival. You are helpless. Right. You can't take care of yourself. So it makes sense that I'm going to do everything I can to make sure... Uh, uh, I'm connected and in favor with mommy and daddy. Otherwise, right. I don't survive. Yeah. And so that happens, uh, you know, at a, such a young age and unconsciously that it feels like it's who we are. Right. And and it is. It's, a, it's an aspect of who we are, but there's a mask that gets created and distortions that get created and, and belief systems that get established in response to whatever the circumstances of our childhood are. And so usually when people come to me or when I started going to therapy, it's when you realize like, mm, there's something about myself that feels off or there's something that I don't understand, or I have this pattern and I keep playing it over and over again. And, you know, I'm blaming the world, but actually it's me. If it's the yeah. same, you know, I'm the, I'm the, uh, the common denominator <laughs> and that process of trying to unravel what happened is, is really what most therapy is about well it's also to give you strategies to compensate for it and that that process is is very it can be very difficult and it's asking us to confront all the things that happened to us in our childhood that were painful or scary right. or caused us to feel uh anger or frustration and all these feelings that we repress and hold back and um and that feel it feels wrong to express or it doesn't feel safe to express them. And so essentially you're you're trying to help people feel the feelings the child could not or would not or wasn't safe for them to feel. Right. Well, when you interviewed Andrew Tate, one thing that really stuck out to me was how you sort of pressed into the topic of his childhood and then his relationship with his father. Right. Mm -hmm. He said something that really stuck out to me, which we talked about off camera, but which was where he said that he had to earn his father's time. Right. right. So what, was there anything that stood out about that, that, that you noticed? You know, I want to be careful here. Cause I, I, I don't want to like psychoanalyze Tate too much publicly, but yeah. I think like, if we can talk in generalities, I, I, I think the idea that we have to earn love is, uh, uh that doesn't feel good to me. I don't want to feel like I have to earn love from my mom or my dad. I feel like I just want love available to me. That said, hey man, dude's badass. Like as he said, my dad raised me perfectly. Like here I am. There's there's always going to be a light and a shadow to everything. So you can 
try to be the perfect parent. I mean, that's an impossible thing, but you're always going to have a bias. And so it doesn't matter what you do. There's always going to be a shadow to it. So there's no escaping getting kind of like, quote unquote, messed up by our parents. Um, But yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, I think everybody, and I think even Tate, like he's, he's aware. Yeah. I, stuff happened with my father that impacted me. He would argue that that impacted me in a good way. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Was it painful? You know, maybe. But, um, and I, you know, and that's a, that's a fair argument. I mean, I have a different perspective on it because of the experiences that I've had. I mean, I'll, right. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story that, that maybe will relate to this. There's a thing that you do in therapy. It's called family constellations. And this is really interesting. So you would get into a room and you'd set up, um, like your mother, your father, maybe you have a brother, your sister, and you kind of position them in a way that feels like how you were related to them. Right. Like just, just intuitively, like where would your mom be? It's almost like you create this sculpture. And for a lot of people, most people, their mom is really close and their dad is further away. Right. And, but sometimes it's really far away. Or sometimes the mom is like blocking the father right. in some way. And the brother's over in the corner. And you, it, it's a kind of an intuitive thing. And then what happens is you, you just, let, it's like an improv and you let it go and, and, you know, the facilitator helps so that you can experience what it was like for you as a child. Right. And, and most of that stuff is, is unconscious. And what I saw was that uh, in 80 percent of the cases, the, the process would end with the child the, or the, the person in their kind of childlike regressed state screaming for the father. Like, daddy, daddy. Whether it's a boy or a girl. Boy or a girl. Okay. And that changed everything for me. I was like, oh, man. Like, these children are longing for the father. And, and the, the absent father, whether it's physically or emotional, uh, is, has a huge impact right. on children. And that the father's role is crucial. Yeah. And so that's the bias that I bring from the experience that I had. And so, of course, I, I apply that on to the way that I interviewed and, and see, uh, or, or I would say see, but uh, make assumptions or, you know, I presume things about what was going on with Tate, which, which you know, that's my bias, right? right? But that's from my experience. That's amazing. Now, have you heard of the YouTube channel Softway Underbelly? Uh, is that the, where he uh, interviews sort of misfits of society yeah. yes i have i've seen and it's beautiful photography yeah yeah so mark um so i sort of know him i've talked to him on the phone facetime a couple times um we're not like friends or anything but one thing that i've picked up from his interviews because he inter- so if you guys don't know what software underbelly is it is a youtube channel where this guy mark who used to be a photographer opened his studio to homeless people on skid row to come in and they interview and he asked them about their life and what they're like and I mean, he interviews everybody, but a lot of the times it's, you know, fentanyl addicts, pimps, gang members, it, anybody, right? The, the, what could be seen as the lowest of society. But one thing that I've noticed about that in those interviews, the common denominator is there's lack of love in the household growing up and usually lack of a father. Yeah. So do you think that that is when somebody goes down a really bad path, whether, I mean, I mean, really bad, right? Yeah. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I mean, I think it's trauma. Yeah. I think it's playing out. And uh, uh, it, listen, people get abused by their mothers all the time. Mother, mothers are just as, quote unquote, bad, you know, or can do just as much damage as fathers. They might just do it in different ways. Right. But, but the absence of the father is is mm-hmm. profound. I mean, I, I would argue and I have argued that, that all the problems are in our society currently are about that about the lack of fathers in the home. And, and I understand why it happened. You know, f- uh, feminism came along and, and that was necessary, but men sort of stepped back. Right. And I think in that place, they abdicated their responsibility. Uh, I, I think we're becoming aware of that now, but you need strong men, you need strong role models, you need discipline. And if you don't have, and, and women generally, I don't you know, make any blanket statements, but generally that's not what they're about. They're about love and caring and nurturance, particularly for children. Right. So if you don't have that balance of the father 
saying, get up, get off your ass, get out of fucking bed. Like, right. you know, you need, you need that energy. You need that firmness and also create safety structure, yeah. creates safety. Okay. And if, Children don't feel safe. They're going to be neurotic and or they're going to feel fearful. The world is not safe. They're not going to feel protected. And, you know, again, when you're a child, you are vulnerable and helpless. So you, you want to feel the strength of the father that he's got it. Yeah. And without that, you're going to have a lot of uh, internal fear, which is going to lead to uh, a, a kind of chaotic upbringing and then what happens is you then project that need for safety onto the government well my dad wasn't there so i need you're going to find the father figure in in the government the government needs to take care of me mm -hmm. and which i think is uh, that has its own problem and i think it's the absence of god right. god the father right. right and so you've you've seen a real movement away from god over the last 20 years in the country yeah. and i understand that you know right. we catholic church and uh, a lot of religions are incredibly corrupt yeah. and so why would you stay with that that said um when you give up that relationship to the father that you know that 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 protector that safety that 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 wisdom right that structure right. then you're living in chaos and if you're living in chaos you're going to you're going to you're going to succumb to addiction. You're going to succumb to bad behavior. You're going to start looking for love and connection and attachment in all the wrong places. And one thing that I noticed that Andrew Tate said, which I was surprised, is you had mentioned, well, we don't know God is real. Like, we don't have proof that God is real. And he actually said, you're right. But then he also said, um, he said, but if you believe in it, and that changes how your world, because you feel like yeah. you're safe, yeah. actually brings safety. Yeah. Yes, a hundred percent. I think that's how reality works. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, I think what we believe is true. Yeah, and we make it true. Yeah. And so, if I believe God is real, as He said, then, um, and I feel more powerful right. because of it, then God is real. Right. It's my belief that makes God real. And uh, yeah, you know, your faith will make it so. Right. What is God to you? God is uh, the animating. Uh, energy or force of the universe right, right? so we're, you and i were animated but yeah. but everything around us is in in some sense animated all living things but not just you know the earth is a living thing right. and i think in that force has its own intelligence and uh i don't think it's an old man sitting in the sky making judgments i think it's uh god is just the isness of everything it, uh, you know, I, I, I did a vision quest, uh, Lakota vision quest, uh, a couple of years ago. I mean, I've done a number of them, but the one I did a couple of years ago and the fourth day, uh, the vision that I got, these words that got downloaded were, um, uh, there is no separation between the light and the dark. Nature has no judgments as judgments or preferences. And God is not concerned with your suffering. And the moment you accept that you're free. And what that meant to me is, you know, no separation between the light and the dark. It's one thing. Okay, so I have to hold the good, good and bad equally right. as part of it. There's no escape from that. And, and that God is not like, or nature, which is really God, yeah. has no preference. So chaos mm -hmm. or calculation? Say more. Would you say the universe is more chaotic or calculated? I think it's, I, I think it's neutral. I think God is neutral, okay. and I think it, we can bring chaos or we can bring order to it. And again, God is not, he's just watching. He's just above, or he, you know, the energy yeah. is just, it's just, it's letting it play out. Right. And so that's our free will, right? We can make choices. Right. And uh, I think there's a reason that God is uh, masculine, you know, because God brings order. And so uh, I think that it's up to men to bring order to the world. And so all the problems we're having, they're only going to be solved by men. Okay. Right? Like it's the man, and because man is like the father is actually the representation of God on earth. Right. And so it's like, it's, it's up to men to bring order to the world. Otherwise, you're going to be in complete chaos. And anyone who's been in any kind of rela real relationship that, that's, that's in polarity, a masculine-feminine relationship that's in polarity, understands that, right? right. Uh, and I'm, again, it, uh, these are not 
uh, blanket statements. It, it, it can be different in different dynamics. But generally, I know in my relationship, it's like it's it's my job to bring order to the relationship. And if I let my woman just make every decision and do whatever she wants, uh, we're going to be in chaos, right? Because that's just how the feminine uh, uh, it's how they orient. It's how they, and so it's, and it's the balance of that. But if I, it's all me, it's all, it's all structure. It's all, we got to do it this way. Yeah. And there's no softness. There's, there's no, um, tenderness. There's no care. Then that completely goes out of balance. So right. it's always a, a balance between those, those two things, but it just feels like right now we've, we're, there's just a lot of chaos in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's why Tate is so popular, right? right? Why Trump is so became so popular and it still is popular is because what they're doing is bringing order and people can feel like, Oh, I want that. I need that. That makes me feel safe. Right. Which is coming from a lot of people missing the father. Child. I think, I think so. And it become, it can become tyrannical and, yeah. and, and you, we have to be careful about that. But, uh, Yeah. Being the father figure. Yes. That's, I've never heard that. I never thought of that, but that's that's completely true, right? People put so much trust in the government, and I think why there's a lot of chaos is people feel like they can't trust the government, right? That's right. Well, they've been lied to, and now they're starting to see that yeah. they've been lied to, and so yeah, they've been betrayed. Yeah. Huh. So how much? So one thing that I see, one thing that is that is really difficult to watch is to hear somebody say that they want, and they genuinely want a certain kind of lifestyle. Maybe they want to make more money, maybe they want to start a business, they want to do, they want to live their passion, whatever it is. But they constantly are self-sabotaging themselves. From a psychoanalyst perspective, where does that come from? Where does this self-sabotage come from? Where we maybe don't believe internally that we are worthy of something, which may be love, like we've said earlier. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? It, fear. It's, it's all just fear based. So, um, I mean, this is this is a from my framework, how I think about it. It's, it's kind of a deep conversation. Um, you know, w w we self-sabotage because we made a decision a long time ago to never be vulnerable. Right. We get hurt as children and we close down and we make a decision like I never want to feel that again. Of course, that's that's a rational thing. So I'm never going to engage in any kind of behavior that might bring about that pain. Right. And so I make a decision. I'm never going to open my heart again. I'm never going to trust again. I'm never going to need again. I'm never going to go after what I want. I'm never going to be here all the way. I'm never going to go for it. I'm never going to show the world who I am. Because all of those things could open me up and could cause me pain. And so that's the self-sabotage mechanism. That is an unconscious decision, a decision we made at two, three, four, five, six years old. We don't remember making it, right. but somewhere along the way, we, we, we made that decision, which is a rational decision to make. Yeah. This pain that I experienced was overwhelming. And I never want to feel it again. So this is the best way to make sure that it never happens again. The, but, you know, when, but then we have this other part of us that wants to expand, that wants to grow, that wants to reach out for love, that wants to be creative and, and fulfill our dreams. And so those two competing parts of us come into contact and it creates a, a bind inside us. And then that bind is uh, kind of intolerable. And so we, we end up self-destructing. We procrastinate, we turn to drugs or pornography or some kind of behavior to alleviate this, this feeling of stuckness and, and tension or, or, or something that's unresolved. It's all happening unconsciously. Um, and so the first thing that you, that I tell people to do is just like first reframe everything is I must be afraid. There must be something I'm afraid of. If I'm, if I want something and I'm not getting it and or I'm sabotaging myself, that self-sabotage mechanism, it must be motivated by fear. What is that fear about? Let me define that fear. Well, if, um, if I go for what I want, right, if, if I'm going to like I, lots of people like I want to, uh, make more uh, social media posts. I want to make videos and put myself out there and they never do it. Right. Well, why don't they do it? Well, what, what's going to happen? Yeah. What is it? What's going to happen? What, what are you afraid of? Right. Well, I'm going to be judged or people aren't going to like it or nobody's going to care. Right. And to the child that might've been overwhelmingly painful, but what you try to have to teach people is like you as an adult that may happen. Well, no, it not, it's going to happen. It's 100% going to happen. If you put yourself out there, 
People are going to tell you you're stupid. People are going to tell you you're no good. People are going to ignore it, all of that. And, but you as an adult, you can tolerate that. You can tolerate what that is and keep going. And what you start to realize is, you know, nobody cares. Like nobody really, really cares. And there's freedom in that. But, but you're not, we're not usually generally operating from that adult mind, especially when we have unresolved trauma. That trauma, that fear takes over and uh and starts kind of running everything and it thinks this is the key it thinks it's protecting us yeah it's keeping us safe well, it's, survival. it's survival exactly it's like uh you know if, if you see that cord maybe your brain thinks it's a snake that's know? exactly okay. yeah yeah so, so how does somebody tap in to their subconscious and change things can they is there a point where you're kind of past the point of no return or never right no no i mean it's it's hard work for sure. It's scary work. I think it starts by, I mean, I think the first thing I would say is you can't do it alone. You, you have to, I'm not saying you have to go to therapy, but you, you need some kind of help from people, whether that's, uh, going to some kind of ceremony with a group of people. I just think you need reflection and you need to see yourself reflected in other people, right? Because when we're isolated, the mind takes over and the mind is always going to tell ourselves stories to, to, to essentially keep ourselves protected. It's going to rationalize. So that would be the, the first thing that I would say to people. And that, and that's scary, but get involved, like find some group, like find a men's group, something yeah. where you can start to share how you actually feel about things and realize that you're not the only one. Like everybody has these feelings right. of fear, anxiety, loneliness, sadness, feeling like I'm not enough. Everybody's got some version of that story. Um, the other thing that I would say is like just to start to get really honest about what you actually feel. And that's a hard thing to do. It's hard because we don't want to let ourselves know how we feel. But letting yourself know what you think and how you feel in every given situation, that's how you get present. Right. It's the only way to be present. And so that that's the first thing I say. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do with my clients is ask them questions to uh, uh, allow them to realize what's actually going on. Right. Which is, you know, I hear this a lot. Like, well, my childhood was, my childhood was great. My parents are really cool. You know, I didn't really have any, any trouble with them. And I'm immediately like, yeah, bullshit. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm sure, I'm sure that's true on one level, but you dig down a little deeper. It's like, actually, no, I fucking hate my mother. You yeah. Know? Or, or it's, it's just a part of them. Right. But because they feel like it's not okay for them to hate their mother or their father or, or, or you know, to be re feel resentful. Yeah. They, they, they bury it. But it's, of course, we all love our mother and our father, you know. Right. Uh, but, but maybe there's a part of us that feels really resentful and angry. And if we don't acknowledge that, if we don't come to terms with that inside ourselves, what's going to happen? We're going to project that out onto the world in some way. And so it's really important that we, we, we start to get extremely honest with how we feel about everything, especially the shadow feelings, especially mm. feelings of hate and judgment and, and like a place where we want to punish or, or get revenge. All the stuff we're told is like not okay. Right. And I'm not saying that it is okay. Yeah. But if it, there's a difference between I feel that and I act out on that. And so acknowledging that you feel a certain way and just letting it be there and then maybe asking yourself, I wonder why I feel this way. Mm. I wonder what this is about. Why do I have such strong feelings of of anger? Why do I hate this person? I mean, yeah. that was a question with Trump. It's like, nobody wanted to ask the question. It's like, why are you so charged up with like, this guy was a reality show star two years ago, media mogul, everybody like thought he was funny and yeah. now you fucking hate him? Yeah. Well, that's not about him. That's about you. Yeah. And what is it in him that's causing you to feel this way? Yeah. Or what is it in you? Sorry, that's that's that, that's evoked by him. Right. Right. So we want to take responsibility for all of that. Right. Huh. So I, I want to talk about the shadow work. But before that, you you. So there's something that I always see in myself and in other people is what people really hate about somebody else, it's coming, and you kind of mentioned this, but it's coming from internally, right? Yeah. So if I think, oh, that guy's so arrogant, so cocky, it's not him, right? It's like that's a mirror, and I'm looking at the things that I don't like in myself. Or what do you think about that? Is that yeah, common? Yeah, that's, 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 yeah, it's <clears throat> projection, right? It's classic projection. Um, <clears throat> we see in others what is, what is disowned in us, you know, in the 
uh, in the addiction community, you spot it, you got it. Yeah. We say that, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, we have parts of ourselves, both light and dark, good and bad, that we disown. And so we want to be aware of what and who we're judging and how and why we're judging, because that's going to give us information about what is disowned in us. Now, that's a hard thing to do right? because we don't want to face the parts of ourselves that are, you know, ugly or mean or arrogant or or weak. Right. Whatever it may be. Um, but less talked about is the people that we admire, the people we really, we really love. Those people that we're fixated on, there's probably something in their light, in in the gift that you see in them that is also in you and disowned in you. So it's important to look at both. Like, who do I hate? Who do I admire? Like, yeah. both of them hold something uh, that is disowned in me. And, and, and what's stopping me from owning that all the way? Right. Yeah, I think that that's something that... Um I just wish that we had like a playbook on like, all right, here's what you need to do. Here's how you can fix your life. But uh, you said, you well, know, I the, do it all the, the time. No, you just write it out. Right. Tell yeah. people I give this exercise to my clients all the time. Write a list of everybody that drives you fucking nuts. OK. And then what is the quality in them that drives you nuts? Where is that quality in you? Go mm. through it. Like take ownership of it. And, 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 today. and, and yeah, it's a, it's a great exercise. And and some of the things you may be like, I don't have that. Do I have that? You know? And then you're like, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Maybe I do. Maybe I am a little bit arrogant. Am maybe, I the asshole? Maybe yeah. I'm the asshole. Well, we're all the asshole at times. Yeah. And it's, it's okay. You know, yeah. you can't, I mean, this, I'm really on this kick right now. It's like, uh, stop trying to be good. Forget good. Just be right. Like we are light and dark. We have both good and bad in us and it must all be necessary. So I'm not saying give yourself permission to just be an asshole, but understand like like this this constant pursuit of to be good, I think is uh, there's a distortion there because it, it the implication there is that that other part of me is not good. And but that other part of you exists. And I think what I'm pushing people towards is aliveness mm. to be fully expressed. And if you're fully expressed, like your shadow is going to come out. But if you can understand that your shadow is really just an expression of your pain and continue to take responsibility for it, continue to understand it um, and not make yourself bad or wrong. That's the key, right? Um, all of our distortions, all the place, the place where we can be cruel or or be an asshole or be arrogant. They're tra it's just a trauma response. Mm. It's just some it's not about it's not at our deepest core who we are. And that's, I think, why people are afraid to to really go into the shadow emotions because they feel like if I don't want to identify with that. Right. But if you can create some separation between you and how you feel or the, the behavior that you exhibit, exhibit, then you can, you can start to kind of just look at it um, and understand that I am not my feelings. I am not my thoughts. I am the thing that's able to observe my thoughts and feelings that, right. and that, that part of me is divine. And so uh, there's nothing about me that's necessarily bad. It's just distorted. Right.
Bye. Bye. Bye.